Tampa has arrived at the Brooks River and brings with it some beautiful fall colors and, of course, some fat bears. I'm Chris Kleesrath, a ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve, and excited to be back here at Brooks Camp. Today I have with me Michael, Dr. Michael Saxton, bear biologist, bear management team, and bear wrangler extraordinaire. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm looking at screen. I'm pretty sure I'm Chris Kleesrath. You're, you're Dr. Michael Saxton. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm Dr. Michael Saxton. I'm with Chris Lisa, and I'll be hosting today. Watch out. Not anymore. No? Oh, did we drop? Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us today, Michael. My pleasure. Yeah. And um, let's start off with uh, what exactly does bear management do? What does bear management do? Um, I mean, most of runs away from bears. Uh, Chris is trying to host a live chat. I'm looking at the bears in the background. Um, so what does bear management do? We've got, we're basically tasked primarily with managing the human people interactions around Brooks Camp and throughout Patmai National Park. Uh, we have a management plan um, that we attempt to implement and follow here. And uh, the bear management team is, is trying to keep the people and bears essentially trying to keep people and bears safe from each other, trying to keep people from having negative interactions with bears, trying to keep the bears um, as it, behaving as naturally as possible out here, trying to reduce the influence that the people have on them in this, in this incredible location. Well, why do bears come into camp in the first place? Why do bears come into camp? So um, it sort of depends on the time of year. Uh, there's lots of different reasons that bears are going to come through camp, but the there's sort of a historic reason and then lots of current reasons. The historic reason is when Brooks Camp and Brooks Lodge were built, um, it was the year 1950, and there were not really any bears around this area. There were a few, but it was not um, not anything like what we see today. And they looked at this area and they thought, boy, there's this wonderful little peninsula that sticks out between where the river is and where the lake is, and wouldn't that be a wonderful spot to have a fishing camp? Uh, fast forward seven years, it turns out that is the perfect bear highway between that lake and that river. So the bears are all trying to get back and forth in their primary eating and resting spots. And so they'll come to camp because that's the most convenient and quick step for them to get there. Uh, then, so that's really the historic broad perspective. And then if we're looking at the proximate causes right now, we've got, if you're looking in June, you'll have um, boarding couples coming to you pretty regularly. Uh, and a lot of that, you can sometimes see females that come to camp because they're trying to lose the males that are following them. Males are tend to be a little bit more wary around the, around the around people than females do. So females may try and come to camp to lose males. Um, but this time of year, we've got a bunch of high bush cranberry that's in camp, uh, and the bears will come in in order to find that food source. Um, we also have these lawns in camp around all of our cabins, uh, and those are mowed regularly. And that creates this really nice uh, bunch of fresh shoots that the bears will come in to graze on. When the bears start grazing on them, the bear management is actually trying to keep them out of camp. We find camp as this, this bear free zone, this bears haven't really heard that. Um, so we try to keep them out of camp, and when they start grazing on these it can be very challenging to, to push them out. It's like a giant salad bar. Yes, it is exactly like a giant salad bar. Is it difficult to keep distance between the people and the bear? It can be extraordinarily challenging to keep distance between people and bears. So we have a, a 50 yard rule here throughout Katmai National Park um, where people are supposed to not approach bears within 50 yards. Um, a place like Brooks Camp, we have so many people, so many bears, a lot of times they can't necessarily see each other until they're well within that 50 yard rule or 50 yard distance. Um, so we do our best, we try and keep them, uh, try and keep them further away, um, but it can be a very challenging task, yeah. What can we do, or your team help us to uh, manage the stress for the bears that would cause? Are we good? Continuing on, uh, manage stress, or how do we reduce stress from, of the bears from, from all the people around? Um, I guess we could go both ways with that. How do we reduce the stress on the people with all the bears around as well? Um, so, primarily, the biggest thing that we're always talking about on bear management is consistency of behavior. Um, we want the bears to know exactly what to expect from us. When we have consistent behavior, the bears can habituate to that behavior and they know whatever those people are doing, it's not going to bother me. It's not something that's hurting me in any way, shape, or form, and I'm just going to go on about my day. 
keep eating, looking for salmon, looking, eating at the salad bar over here, doing whatever they're doing. Um, when we start getting inconsistent behavior, that's when it starts to stress the bears out a lot because they don't really understand what we're doing. Um, you know, conversely, it can be very tricky, of course, and there's a lot of people out here that have never seen a bear before, and it's, of course, very stressful for them as well. We do our best with bear school to try and educate people when they're coming in so that they know uh, how to behave out here and what, what they should be doing, both in order to keep themselves safe and then also so that we can reduce the stress for the bears. Actually, um, I knew a, a bear biologist who I really appreciated the way he would talk about it. He said that it can be, it can be really hard to know how to act around these large, unpredictable mammals, but somehow the bears seem to have figured it out. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a good way of putting it. We, we often think of other large mammals as being unpredictable, but in a place like this, people are very much so often the unpredictable ones. So try and manage that. That makes sense. Um, so if you do have to run them out of camp, I think you refer to that as hazing. Mm -hmm. um, what are your most effective methods? Most effective? Um, so I guess that depends on how we're defining it. Most commonly used and generally very effective gotten to them, scuffing our feet in the gravel, that sound of the gravel can be pretty, uh, pretty uh, frightening for them. So that's just the effect of them out. Um, if those are not, I guess, so if I'm finding effective as the ones that are going to have to cause the strongest response, we have lots of other tools that we can use. Noise makers, um, we've got, uh, you know, we might break, we might break uh, branches and stuff like that. When we break branches, that can sound like another big male coming through. Uh, so that sort of thing tends to get a, a strong response. Generally, want to be careful with some of those things. If we're breaking branches, trying to sound like a big male, um, if it's a big male we're hazing, he may not appreciate that, and he may think that there's a challenger nearby and, and uh, try and come scare scare that challenger off. Uh, so there's all sorts of things like that that we can do, all the way up to you know we have um, we have bean backgrounds that we can shoot out of a out of a 12 gauge 12 gauge shotgun essentially, uh, and that'll hit the bear, bounce off, causes a little bit of pain, generally it startles them. Those are things we usually only use. We don't use them very often at all anymore, but usually we'd only use that if we've got a bear that is regularly engaging in property destruction or anything like that, then we may escalate to those uh, those higher levels of hazing. Okay. Um, so when you see the bears wander through camp, uh, a lot of people who are not familiar with them look and say, oh my gosh, look, the friendly bears. It's not quite accurate, is it? Uh, I would not define any of the bears, or any bears worldwide really, as friendly. Um, I would describe the bears at Brooks Camp as well fed, uh, and I would probably describe them as um, fairly habituated. So as, as I mentioned earlier, that's, that term basically means that they are used to us, we are a neutral presence in their environment, so they're not going to have a positive or a negative response to us. Uh, and as long as they are well habituated and well fed, yeah, they tend to ignore us for the most part. Um, there are some that are going to have stronger responses to us than others, but uh, yeah, for the most part, they tend to be pretty well habituated here around Brooks Camp. I found uh, when I'm on the trail that, not to say I have the most trouble with them, but it seems to me the subs are the most curious. Uh, do you find that to be true? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Sub adults, uh, I mean, sub adults are teenagers. That's, they're teenagers. They're, they're testing their limits. They're seeing, um, seeing where they fit in the social hierarchy around here and uh, what they can get away with and what they can't get away with. Um, so we tend to have a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting times with sub adults in bear management. Um, we spend a lot of time chasing them out of camp. Uh, it seems like it's always sub adults that are, you know, not always, but it's often sub adults that we're having issues with property destruction. Um, bears that are getting into dominance interactions with us or acting a little bit more defensively or aggressively with us. Uh, oftentimes that's sub adults that we're dealing with when we find those things. Um, and that's just them learning there, you know, you might get a bear that tries to, tries to bluff charge you because it's trying, you know, it's getting pushed around by every other bear out here. And it's wondering, well, can I push you around? I want to know if I can push you around. And so we just have to teach, teach them that, uh, that we are dominant them or convince them that we are dominant to them, whether that's true or not. Um, make them make them believe that, and uh, then we're usually pretty good. Yeah, they, they can be a bit of a handful at times. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, so if you had to talk to the visitors and tell them what's the most important thing they should learn when they're here and take home with them, what would it be? Most important thing to take home. Um, Boy, that's a really good question and a really tough one to answer. I think that that's going to be 
really unique to each individual and what person, what their, what their ideas are and their impressions are about the field of the You know, we get people come out here that are everything from uh, bears are good and heavenly animals and I want their land to be as one to bears are the most terrifying things on the planet and they are just killing machines and murder me. Um, I think that learning that either of those is true wild animal. They was out here trying to survive. Uh, they, just, they just sort of need the space to do that. Uh, it's, it's an important thing. Uh, I think mean, one of the unique things about Brooks Camp is that we have the ability to sort of see the unique differences between the individual there and uh, see the changes in behavior. Sorry, we've got some mosquitoes trying to <laughs> try to eat me here. Uh, so we can see those sorts of things, and that's a really unique thing that we can take away from Brooks Camp as well, is the, the differences between you had to tell me what the most difficult part of your job is. What was that mean? Human management. Human management. Um, yeah, 100% human management. Um, we need to add that to your title then. Yeah, human management. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it can be it can be tricky, and it's nobody's fault. Uh, generally, it's nobody's fault. Um, most people are not coming here thinking, "Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to break all the rules and I'm going to cause problems." Um, but we have rules out here that are very unique and that you don't find in most other places, whether there are bear management, you know, whether there are bear issues in those places or not. We've got our, our food storage regulations that say you can't, you cannot carry food outside. And that includes coffee, tea, gum, mints, anything like that. You can't carry that with you while you're walking around outside and you can't eat it while you're walking around outside. Even for me, as this is year 10 for me out here, every season when I show up in the spring, there is at least one time where I am eating a granola bar and I start to walk out of my cabin because it is it is so hard to remember that when you're not, you know, you've been away from here. For, uh, so for people that are coming for the first time, that's a really difficult thing to, to remember. Um, distance regulations, similar idea. I mean, how many people can can accurately judge 50 yards? Uh, that's I, I do it on a daily basis and have been doing it for 10 years and I still can be wildly off sometimes without a rangefinder. Um, so all of these things can be really tricky, um, and it's generally not that people are trying to cause problems, but uh, people are excited about seeing bears, which is great. We want people to be excited, um, but sometimes that excitement can override good judgment, and um, and so then we just have to we end up reminding people a lot about the different regulations. And when you get home, how long does it take you to acclimate to the fact that you can actually <laughs> walk outside with food? Um, uh, boy, sometimes I don't. Uh, there are times where it'll be. In February, and I'm still like, wait, am I allowed to eat outside? Um, or I'll be chewing gum, and I, and I oh, God, okay, I got to spit this out before I go somewhere. Uh, when I was working on my dissertation down at Washington State, um, there would be times I'd be driving down the road in Pullman, Washington. Uh, the only brown bears that we have in Pullman, Washington, are the ones that were captive that we were that we were working with at WSU. Um, you'd be driving down the road and you'd see a brown object on the side of the road and be like, Bear. you know, you kind of like, you're instantly triggered for that, for that uh, response. But, uh, so it can take quite a while. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it, it seems to vary quite a bit. Yeah. Well, since you spend so much time with the bears, mm -hmm. can you think of anything this season that has really piqued your interest or been mm -hmm. unusual? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, most unusual thing that I have seen this season is 909 and 910. Um, so these, for anyone who is unfamiliar with this, uh, which you are, you probably are all more familiar with it than I am, but, um, so 909 has a, uh, yearling and 910 has a spring cub, I think if I'm remembering correctly, uh, make sure I don't switch those two up. Um, and they have been out here and I went on vacation for a week actually, and I came back and people were telling me there's these two sows with different age cubs. And they're like hanging out and playing all the time. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure they are. Like, I'm sure they're like in the vicinity of each other or whatever, like, but they're not, they couldn't, clearly they're not playing because sows that are not, you know, sows with, with, with cubs are not just going to hang out together all the time. You might see them occasionally be in the fishing in the same area and the cubs might play together or something like that. But I, yeah, then I witnessed it for myself right here at the, at the little platform, seeing these two sows just playing together for an hour while their cubs played together. And uh, I have never seen or heard of anything quite like that. Um, it's been very unique. People have told me, although I have not seen it myself, people have told me that they've been sharing fish, uh, which is extraordinarily 
unusual. Um, that's just not something we usually see. It is noteworthy that 909 and 910 are siblings. Um, so it's possible that they're just, you know, they just remember playing with each other growing up and trust each other enough to be around each other's cubs. But it's a, it's a very unique situation. I've never seen anything like that. Um, it's pretty amazing. We've seen it up at the falls. We've seen them down here a great, uh, great deal of time. Yeah. Um, I've seen 909 go off and leave her cub with 910 and the other cub, um, and, and be perfectly content with it. So it, it's very unusual. Such an unusual thing. And I, I feel so grateful to have gotten to witness that. I mean, that's just, um, yeah, like I said, I've, I've been working with bears for a long time and I've just never heard of or seen anything like that. Um, I remember hearing reports from McNeil River at one point in time of um, multiple sows that all kind of got together and they had several cubs and they, they were all fishing in the same area. And then they kind of all separated, but one of the sows ended up with all of the cubs for about 24 hours. So there was a sow walking around the thing and goes 11 cubs uh, for a little oh while. Gosh. So that's like the closest that I've heard to something like this, where they're all kind of together and, um, and playing together to a certain extent. Um, they did get that sorted out and all the okay. cubs got back to the correct, uh, back to the, from what I heard, once again, this is all just reported to me. Um, but yeah, so from what I heard, they did get, they did get that sorted out. But uh, yeah, just a very, a very unusual um, circumstance. Uh, other unique things from this summer, we had a lot of courtship in camp this spring, um, far more than I feel like I have seen in past years. Uh, it does get a little bit tricky because having been here for 10 off, uh, the years blend together. It becomes very difficult to remember what happened in what year or anything like that, um, which bears had cubs in which years, stuff like that all tends to get blended together in my mind. Um, but it does seem like we had just a ton of courtship occurring this spring, just lots of courting couples going through camp, which normally, and like I said at the beginning, normally the females might run through camp in order to try and lose the male because she's like, I don't wanna be around you. Um, we had some of our big males running through camp very regularly early season because they were following females constantly. I, I heard on the radio the call out 856 and I heard he was headed in the different direction. I wanted to grab a skinny picture, hopefully <laughs> for uh, for Fat Bear Week. And I opened up the door not realizing that he was walking right, right alongside the auditorium. Uh -huh. And if he looks big in the river, he is <laughs> tremendous. Like that close. I just oh, yeah. said, this is your spot. Turned around, went back into the auditorium and let him have his way. He was he's... tremendous. And he spent a lot of time in camp. He is an impressive animal. Yeah, I love I love working with him in camp just because he is so enormous. And you get the opportunity to see him like walk by a tree and be like, all right, he's right there on the tree. And then you go back afterwards and measure, you know, do a rough estimate. I haven't actually taken a tape measure out there, but just kind of rough estimate. Like, all right, where is he? And it's just, that guy is enormous. Um, he's got to be five foot at the shoulder and nine to 10 feet when he stands up. It's just impressive. Yeah, I saw him over scratching his his back on a tree on a valley road and went up and could see how high the uh -huh. hair was on the trees. He's tremendous. I had, I had one incident early season where, um, it was him. I'm trying to remember who the other male was, but there was him and another male, both chasing after a female. And, um, I had what was, what I was, I was not happy about at the time, but afterwards looking back on it's kind of unique circumstance, but, he and the other male split and went on opposite sides of me, both within about five feet of me as I'm sitting there going, okay, don't just ignore me guys. Don't worry about <laughs> me. Like, I'm not trying to manage anyone right now. Just trying to stay alive. Just <laughs> go about your lives. <laughs> if you had to pick your favorite part of your bear biology and your uh, wildlife biology and your bear management, and what would it be? Favorite part meaning, like, I mean, like, I love hibernation you, physiology. You, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I was going to ask that. I know there's no way to really answer this, but if you go back to 909 and 910, what are the chances they could actually hibernate together? If, I know there's no way to prove it or even yep. to know, but is it possible? And the, uh, I mean, possible, absolutely. These are those things where I, as a, you know, classically trained wildlife biologist, I'm like, man, I really wish I had collars on these animals. Mm -hmm. That way I could look at where they're going, where they're denning. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, I certainly think it's possible. I think it's a very interesting possibility, even if they're not in, I, I think it's unlikely they would be in the same den, but like going back and denning near each other on the same hillside would be fascinating to me. Um, yeah, be absolutely incredible to see. I'm curious to see if, um, 
nine or nine will hold her cub a year longer if they're all mm. hanging out together. So I guess we'll just have to wait until next year to see that. Interesting if she thought. she would hold an extra summer just so they can all stay together. Or will they continue, you know, if, if she emancipates her cub, will she continue to hang out with the other two? That's true. Um, or will, uh, who, if will nine, 10 not feel comfortable with, uh, you know, with her hanging out when, when 909 doesn't have a cup with her. But. I suppose I'd come back next year and find out. Uh, I suppose I might be willing to do that. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, I mean, I don't have anything in anything specific that I would am interested in talking about, but I'm confident that there are some, uh, some questions I'm rolling saying, in over here. So you want to roll here. some questions? How do the people fishing coexist successfully with the bears? How do people fishing coexist successfully with the bears? Interesting question. I suppose it depends on how, depends on how you define coexisting. Um, we've been pretty fortunate all throughout Katmai National Park. We've got, I mean, this is a very popular fishing destination, uh, not only here, but several of the other, several of the other rivers throughout the park and preserve. Um, and we get a lot of people fishing very close to a lot of bears. Um, realistically, it comes down to people being willing to, uh, you know, take a step back occasionally and let a bear go through. And also the bears are extraordinarily tolerant of us being here, not just, not just fishermen, but, um, uh, photographers and people just walking the river. I mean, I, I both fish and, uh, and take fish in this, in this river occasionally and, uh, not, you know, people in the river, people in camp, these bears are extraordinarily tolerant of all of us. Um, it's, yeah, it can be a, a tricky coexistence at times, but thankfully in this area, there's just so much food available that it's not like if the bear can't get into this one fishing hole where the angler is that, you know, that it's going to cause them any sort of irreparable life harm. Um, so they'll just kind of move on to a different, a different area and, uh, go fish in that different area. But yeah, it can certainly be tricky for both the, the anglers and the bears. Yeah. Okay. How about our next question? How do you manage moms with cubs a little different than single sows or boars? Um, so managing sows with cubs. Um, sows with cubs, you know, can be tricky. Of course, the, the standard belief is that uh, sows with cubs are dramatically more dangerous than, um, than other classes of bears. And I'm not sure that that's true here at Brooks Camp. Um, here at Brooks Camp, it's a lot of the sows, I mean, as I've mentioned, they use us sort of as a defense against males. Um, they'll use us as a babysitting service. They kind of come in and uh, drop their cubs off occasionally in camp while they go fishing. Um, so I think that a lot of the more habituated sows are pretty easy to deal with. And I'll give an example of this. There was, must've been 2019. I had a sow with two, I don't know if they, I don't remember if they were yearlings or two year olds at the time. It was very early season. One of the first bears I dealt with in the season. And um, she was an extraordinarily habituated bear. She's coming through camp and one of her cubs, I'm trying to chase him out of camp. And one of her cubs kind of sees me and he's like, oh, maybe he wants to play. Maybe that's why he's making all of this noise. And the cub just kept getting closer and closer to me. And I'm, you know, I'm yelling at it, I'm clapping, I'm stomping my feet and stuff. And every time I do, the cub will kind of take a, take a step back and then slowly start creeping in again. So slowly we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer until this cub is literally at my feet. And at this point I'm going, okay, mom is 30 feet away over there. I've got a cub right here. And the next thing it's gonna do is like reach out and, and you know take a swipe at my leg here. So I've got two options. I can either kick it or I can spray it. So I pulled out my bear spray and I sprayed it and it yelped and it ran off. And that's a, you know, that's something I've always thought about. I was like, what am I going to do if I have to spray a cub? Um, so I spray this cub. My eyes are on mom the whole time. And the cub yelps and mom looks it up. She looks at the situation and then she keeps on grazing. No concern about it. Probably just like, oh, fine. That kid's finally getting what he deserves over there, huh? I just didn't, didn't seem to be worried about it. Now there are other sows that would probably not be their response. But if they heard that cub yell, particularly if they could not see what the threat was, mm -hmm. um, it, it has the potential to go 
very badly. Um, so that is something that we think about a lot and uh, we definitely weigh in all of our uh, decision making when we're dealing with Bears through camp. Did you find you deal with the moms and sows and single females more than the boars in camp? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, other than I suppose if I'm talking adult boars, yeah, we don't get we don't get adult males coming through camp all that often. Um, so we get the sub adult males will come through, but other than during um, courting, we really don't see much of the adult males. So we'll see females far more common. Too busy at the falls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so why leave up there? <laughs> exactly. What bears have proved a challenge in Brooks Camp this year? Is 901 still a regular visitor? Um, well, I think this, I think this uh, the person asking this question already knows the answer because yes, 901 is the one that has proved a, a regular challenge around Brooks Camp this year. Um, she, has, she has caused uh, a few problems for us, both in terms of not wanting to listen to us uh, when we tell her to leave camp. And she doesn't always appreciate us telling her to leave camp. Um, and then, I mean, like the, you know, the, the lodge has a, a boat that's been moored offshore over here and she's popped their buoy a couple of times. Um, she's pretty good at the, like, oh, where are planes trying to land right now? I can go lay down right there. That would be a good spot to hang out. Um, so she's been, she's been a pretty consistent challenge. Um, overall, we've been pretty fortunate this year. I don't think we've had... Uh, we haven't had too many bears that are trying to cause a bunch of problems. We haven't had any bears that are tearing everything up. We did have, and I don't know which bear it was or even if it was the same bear, but I did get reports that a bear got onto one of our boats twice um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and that, and you know, maybe t uh, tore up some, some uh, PFDs and stuff like that. But um, I don't think we've had any huge problems. You know, in some years past, we've had a bear that was getting into cars regularly because it figured out how to open door handles. Um, we've had bears that were digging up sewer lines all the time. We haven't had anything like that. So it's been pretty I think good. They did, I think one of them did get into the water lines at one point. Um, yeah, that's true. We did have one. Uh, we did have a water main get broken at one point early season. Uh, that shut down water in camp for a couple of days. Um, and that was an interesting one because we actually didn't even know that that, I don't know, I'm not, a, uh, not in any way, shape, or form qualified to talk about water systems, mm -hmm. but... Uh, there's a, it's whatever it was, like a stub out or something, some endpoint on the water main. And uh, we apparently did not even know that that endpoint existed from what I was told. So this bear helped us uh, identify a feature of our water system that we didn't know was there. So, you know, thank you for, for, for okay. that bear. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 901 was also one of the ones being courted, wasn't she? Oh, yes. By 856, um, uh, pretty consistently. I think 856, 747. Um, there, there were several big males that were they were following her around she was uh she was very popular and i expect that she will probably show up with spring cubs next year that's fine with us <laughs> she certainly has the she certainly has the body fat to have cubs this year so that's uh that's good she, yeah it's looking pretty good we've got some good contenders mm, so, yep. uh, really packing the pounds on do you have another question all right how is bear management at cat my different from other parks mm, great question um so I've worked at Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park and Denali National Sp National Park. So I can speak to those ones a little bit more intelligently, and then I have um, I'm familiar with basically every park that's got a bear management plan. I'm somewhat familiar with it, but uh, I can tell you that no other park with brown bears slash grizzly bears has the distance that we've got at 50, 50 yards. That would be I mean I came from Denali the year before I started here, and um, yeah when I was when I was first being trained uh, by Imes Vaughn. Um, he, uh, you know, we started walking around doing our thing and, uh, he's showing me what we're doing in bear management here and the distance that we're doing at. And at one point I just turned to him and I was like, I'm, this is insane. We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly we haven't yet. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty unique situation just in terms of, uh, what, you know, these bears, these coastal brown bears are just, um, so much more willing to tolerate people than a lot of the interior bears are. Um, so certainly that's a big difference. Uh, you know, Sequoia Kings Canyon, Yosemite, those sorts of places, you're going around, you're doing a lot more, um, hazing bears on campgrounds and, uh, and, um, using those bean backgrounds to try and teach them that black bears are a very different game than, than brown bears are. Um, particularly those Sierra black bears are, are uh, a unique challenge. Um, so you're doing a lot more trying to, trying to keep bears from getting into campers food. We're very fortunate 
here at, at Brooks Camp and really throughout Camp My, the, um, the level of ability and access we have to communicate appropriate behavior to every visitor. I mean, at Brooks Camp, everybody has to go through their bear orientation. Um, and so everybody hears those rules. Uh, and elsewhere in the park, everybody is basically with a guide. I'm mean, almost everybody, not 100%, but almost everybody is with a guide. So everybody has somebody there that can tell them, you know, how to behave appropriately. Uh, and other parks you just don't have that. You've got people are driving in. Um, they might get a piece of paper that explains the rules, which they may or may not read. Um, it's just it's just a lot tougher um, to to really communicate that message effectively to everyone. So we're very fortunate with that. I was at Yellowstone last year, and I think it was a hundred yards, and it was just on the paper they received when they came yeah. through the gate. So you have to take for granted they're going to read it, and yeah. that doesn't know what's happening. So it's a challenge, I'm sure. Can you talk more about the importance of the food source and bear management? Are bears more difficult to manage mm -hmm. in areas when the salmon run is significantly delayed? I think it's been in, maybe, or maybe in years when the salmon run is okay, significantly delayed. Okay, in years, okay. Yeah. So, um, so uh, how important is the food source? Yeah, I mean, I've been here 10 years and I have never truly seen a poor salmon year. Um, a bad salmon year in Bristol Bay is not necessarily a bad salmon year at Brooks Camp. Um, our escapement, so the state manages escapement for the whole watershed, and our escapement has managed to be anywhere from 800,000 to 2 million fish. Um, the last couple years have been extraordinary. I mean, I think last year we had, our escapement was like 4 million fish, 4.1 million, something like that. So we've been way above our escapement goals the last few years. Um, but I have not. I don't believe I have seen a year where we've dropped below that escapement of 800,000, so I think we've hit the escapement goals every year that I've been here. Um, I don't know, I think that this would be an interesting and challenging place to be in a year that we did not meet escapement goals. Um, hungry bears are unpredictable bears. Uh, that's, yeah, that, that would be a, an interesting time to be here. Without food source, I mean, that's sort of a standard thought process on why coastal brown bears, why we can deal with them at these closer distances, why they will habituate to us and tolerate us at close distance. Um, the standard thought process is they have really good, good food available to them. They have these concentrated feeding areas like the Berkshire over here where they get together and because they're in close proximity to one another all the time, they sort of are forced to come up with a, a method of communicating with each other that doesn't simply involve hitting each other. Um, so that, and then that, that ability to sort of communicate with each other and tolerate each other transfers over to other large mammals after a period of initiation. That's kind of the standard thought process of how that works. Um, if you remove that food source, uh, then bears are going to be fighting with each other a lot more, trying to get the food that is available. Um, and I imagine they would become uh, less tolerant of people and more so I'm guessing. Yeah, you probably you certainly see fewer bears in the falls as well. Right now, but, yeah, some bears may move out of other areas, which could could uh, alleviate the issue to a certain extent. But yeah, could could be certainly. Yeah. Are there any close encounters between visitors or rangers and the bears on the trails this summer? Uh. I mean, I think that that's sort of a, a pretty much every day kind of an encounter, kind of a situation. Uh, the people on the bear management team, including me, we are uh, very regularly pretty close to the bears in order to get them to respond to us, in order to get them out of camp. We are regularly having to get uh, much closer than anyone should feel comfortable doing. Um, and then, of course, yeah, we all the time on the trails, you have the, like I talked about at the beginning, you can't necessarily see the bears until you're kind of right next to them. I think I had one earlier this season, I was walking down the Falls Trail um, with my family, and we're, we're going down the trail, and all of a sudden, you know, you look to the side, and 10 feet away from us, there's a bear walking towards us. It's like, all right, well, just get past it, and let it, uh, you know, because it's already moving right to where we are, so we just get past this area, it'll walk right behind us, and that's, um, that's pretty typical. Uh, I don't think... I have not had any this year where I've had to like physically throw somebody out of the way of a bear. Um, that has happened before. And that hasn't happened to me and I haven't heard about anybody else having to do that this summer. So I don't think we've had any 
quite that extreme, but yeah, we get we get close encounters all the time. There's just no avoiding them out, out in a place like this. I find, especially when they're not moving, I seem to walk up on them. Oh. I say, you know, look over and they're 10 feet away. I think I'm just going to move quietly away. And yeah. Sometimes they're sleeping, sometimes they're just sitting there looking at you and you don't see them until you walk up on them. So it's pretty yeah. common to get close to them by accident. And, it, and if, the, if the question is more about close encounters, as in like, were there any encounters that became problematic uh, somebody on somebody on the bear management team had to bear spray i th think it was 901 once um i believe that's our only bear spray incident for the bear management team this year which is once again good um it, yeah we did not have too many big issues this year which is great Have bears ever been so habituated that they had to be trapped and relocated? Uh, okay, so that's a really interesting question. So that, to me, if I'm understanding that question correctly, that's coming from a perspective on habituation that um, people in coastal Alaska uh, don't necessarily ascribe to. So for a long time, in places like, I don't know if that's a plane taking off right now, I can't hear myself on too just one second here. Uh, that's better. Now it's kind of further away. Okay. Uh, anyway, so in, in places like when I was working in Sequoia Kings Canyon um, and sort of for a while in places like Yellowstone, Glacier, and a lot of other places, there was the idea that habituation in and of itself was a bad thing that made, made encounters more dangerous when the bears were habituated. Uh, I'm not convinced that that is the case. I think that habituation can lead to food conditioning which is a problem. Um, food conditioning is when the bears are getting food from people, when they are going after people in order to try and acquire our food. Um, and when bears are highly habituated in some areas, that can certainly make it more likely that they're going to become food conditioned because they're going to become campsites and stuff like that. So they're going to be around, around our food more often so that they may become food conditioned as a result of being habituated. So in some of those places, being habituated can be a bad thing. In a place like Brooks Camp, where we have such tight control over the availability of human food, uh, habituation is what allows this place to work. Um, certainly, habituation can be a bad thing in that uh, I really, the habituation that's a bad thing is us getting habituated to beggars, which happens very quickly out here. Um, and that can certainly be a dangerous thing. We get to the point where we think, oh, it's no big deal if I'm really close to bears because they're, you know, they're not going to hurt us. They're totally fine. Uh, and that's true until it isn't. Um, until you get that, you know, the wrong bear on the wrong day or something like that, and then you've got a problem. So trying to avoid our habituation to them is something that's really critical. Um, we have not trapped and re relocated any bears due to habituation issues. Uh, there were... Back in the 60s and 70s, I want to say, um, there were a few bears that were relocated. There were several bears that were relocated to other areas of the park. Um, generally, that was because they were becoming food conditioned. They were getting food out of trash, out of the trash, and stuff like that. Here, we had different means of, uh, of dealing with our waste in those days, and um, sometimes the food would become available to them. I mean, for a while, they were trying to boat trash to the far side of the lake. Uh, but they would do so at the same time every week, and the bears started to anticipate that. So the bears would be waiting for them when they would show up with the trash. Um, so there's all sorts of things like that where when the bears were getting food, they would sometimes be re relocating bears as a result of that. Um, we, I do not know when the last time a bear was relocated in Katmai was. Um, it's been a while, and if I reread Heart of Katmai, then I can find that information. But uh, it's been a while since... Uh, since I've thought specifically about that. We haven't relocated a bear in a while. I think the last time that it was done, I think, don't remember the year, but there was an incident where um, they were relocating a bear in a plane and the plane actually crashed. And um, all of the people on board were able to make it out. But they were not able to get the bear out. So the bear was drugged in a culvert trap and ended up drowning as a result. And I believe that was the last time that Katmai attempted to relocate a bear. And see why they wouldn't want to do that again. Yeah. How do you, how do you, I'm sorry, I can't read that one. Uh, Tourist managed. Oh. Like, uh, 
whistling or a baby child crying on the platform. Mm. Oh, a baby or a baby or a baby child crying child on the platform. Crying. Well, okay. So if there's a baby or a child crying on the platform, uh, the chances are it's mine. Um, cause there's not too many other, uh, babies coming through camp and I've got a six month old out here all summer this year. So, uh, uh, thankfully he doesn't cry much. So that's been, we've been pretty fortunate there. Um, otherwise, I mean, if there's, if there is a baby crying, there's a baby crying. Generally we try to keep, um, we try to keep people calm, you know, quiet, calm and respectful on the platforms. We would prefer that people, you know, not be, um, doing anything to try and get the attention of the bears. Um, so we'll, we'll ask people not to do that. I would say if there is, if there is a baby crying, there's a baby crying. There's, there's not much anyone can do about that. And that's fine. Um, it, in general, it's not going to have a huge impact on the bears. It's certainly not going to do anything that's going to, uh, you know, have any sort of irreparable, uh, cause any irreparable harm to a bear. So it'll be, that would be fine. Um, but yeah, we do certainly ask people, you know, if there are, uh, if they're watching bears at the falls and the bears are catching fish, um, sometimes people get really excited about that and they want to, you know, cheer the bear, cheers the bear. And so we always, um, ask people not to clap or anything like that when they see those sorts of things. Um, yeah, we ask people not to make noises, call to the bears, anything like that. We're always, um, wanting people to be as respectful as possible towards the wildlife. And once again, back to that, you know, that purpose of bear management, we want to be reducing our impact on the bears as much as possible. Uh, so we're always trying to, you know, encourage people to, to uh, keep the maximum distance, even if that is beyond 50 yards, if it seems like it is impacting the bear, we'll still ask people to move out of the way and um, give the bears more space or, um, yeah, just be extra quiet so that we're not, not impacting the bears as much as possible. All right. I think that's all we have for you today, Michael. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks uh, for having me. And yeah. uh, helping uh, answer our questions. And um, we appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks again for having me out here. It's been fun. Always happy to be out here. I know so much has happened. <laughs> we've had bears playing behind us and fish jumping, so we've been a little distracted sometimes. Uh, but thanks for joining us all. Uh, next week's live chat is going to be with Mark Sturm, the superintendent. If you want to submit some questions uh, to him in advance, you're welcome to go on to the answer, ask a bear question on explore.org. Um, I think that's it for us today. So thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Kleesrath, uh, ranger out here at Catline and um, Dr. Michael Saxon.